Uh, hello? Hello, uh, are you making a video on Five Nights? And, uh, if so, um, why? Why are you doing that? This game is old as hell. Nobody cares about it anymore. You know, if you really wanted views, you should have talked about, like, Metroid Dread or something. What about that? I mean, everybody's talking about that. Uh, you know what? Forget about it. Just, just do your thing, man. It's none of my business, so, uh... Yeah, talk to you, uh, whenever. You know, never, probably. The year is 2014. Creepypastas are still relatively popular, kinda. Indie horror games are now household names, and a little game called Five Nights at Freddy's is released to the public and skyrockets to popularity. This can be chalked up to a number of things between its very small price tag, its unique gameplay, and all the popular YouTubers playing it and screaming in horror at the cartoon chicken. Welcome to Five Nights at Freddy's. Welcome to Five Nights at Freddy's! Today I'm playing Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> Oh, where'd the rabbit go? Probably stopped playing this game. It was so boring. <laughs> Alright. <clears throat> we're, done, we're done with this game. Five Nights at Freddy's has gotten a billion plus games, a bunch of fan games, there's a new one coming to consoles, and at some point they were making a movie, or... I think they were. I don't know. I haven't heard anything in a while, so I don't know what's up with that. But the point is, it's a pretty big deal, and I was totally hooked when it first came out. I thought it was amazing. I would be talking to my friends at school about it, and everyone was talking about it and making their own theories. And I admit, even though everyone just shits on these games now, it is still a little bit of a nostalgia trip for me. So just for funsies, I'm gonna do a little retrospective on this old series, because I feel like it. And it's a spooky game, and it is October, so I can't think of a better time to talk about it, so let's rock and roll. The original Five Nights at Freddy Fazbin's Pizza Hotel from 2014 is a game about a security guard working the night shift at a dog-ass pizza restaurant called Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. The goal of the game is to make it to the morning before getting caught by one of the restaurant's animatronics and subsequently jammed inside of an empty costume, getting brutally killed in the process. The game itself is incredibly minimalistic, it's a very less is more kind of game. Scott Cawthon and the boys pulled the old Donkey Kong Country voodoo and made all these 3D models of rooms and animatronics and turned them into pre-rendered GIFs, meaning it can run on any piece of garbage you can get your hands on. The gameplay consists of sitting in a cramped security office while watching four animatronic characters with security cameras and closing doors to make sure they don't enter the room and rip off your face. Sounds fair enough, except that watching the cameras and closing the doors takes up battery power and if it runs out you'll be completely defenseless and if you're not close to 6am, you're screwed. Why does holding a door closed take battery power even though it's pulled down by gravity? Shouldn't it take more battery power to hold it open because you're working against gravity? Well, the thing about logic in video games is that you can try to apply it, but if the gameplay, logic notwithstanding, is engaging enough, it's really not that important. Uh, hey, Kojima, that's not how the Fulton system works, it's actually- Yeah, shut up, nerd, this is fun as hell. Although there is a lot of random chance to Five Nights at Freddy's, especially on the later nights and the 420 mode, there is still a degree of skill. The animatronics all have different patterns and require you to balance different strategies to keep them all at bay and prevent them from killing you. You gotta know where they are so you can know when to close the doors and when not to so you can avoid wasting battery power. You gotta check on Foxy every three seconds because he can just barge in at any time if you don't shower him with attention. Needy bastard. In terms of scare factor, the big thing people always talk about is the jump scares. Most of us would probably agree that jump scares are kinda overused and stupid, but what makes it so much more effective in Five Nights is the build-up, and the understanding that if you do get jump scared, it's because you fucked up as the player. So when you're playing the game, it's you versus the jump scaring robots. If you make it to the end of the night without getting jump scared, it's a nice feeling. It's like you outsmarted these weird 
completely intelligent robo-bitches. Although the gameplay and atmosphere of Five Nights is surprisingly immersive and unbearably tense, what really made the game popular was actually the story. On the surface, this is not at all a narrative-driven game. There's no big-ass expository cutscenes where Nathan Drake tells you the ancient history of how Benito Mussolini found an ancient pizzeria and then his soul possessed a calzone which went on to curse the animatronics. No, 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 no. There's none of that. The story is hidden in little snippets scattered around the background, and what made it so engaging is that even though these snippets have a lot of pertinent information to the story, there were still a lot of unanswered questions that were just up in the air and kind of open to interpretation. Why are the animatronics trying to kill you? Do they just kill anyone on sight after hours like the phone guy said, or is it a personal vendetta against Mike Schmidt himself? Who is the phone guy? Where does he fit into the puzzle and how much does he know? What's the bite of 87 and which robot did it? What's the deal with Golden Freddy? Why do I not get fucking hazard pay for such a clearly dangerous job? And when will MatPat make a video connecting Earthworm Jim 3D to the works of Frederick Nietzsche? The answers to most of those questions are hidden in plain sight. Whether it's the newspaper clippings or subtext within the phone guy's messages, missing children, animatronics smelling like corpses, stained with blood and mucus, behaving strangely, it turned the internet into a group of Sherlock Holmeses. Zis. Zis, zis, zis. Actually, one of my favorite MatPat videos from back in the day is his first Five Nights theory, where he determines that your character is actually the murderer and he was arrested and convicted, now spending the remainder of his life on death row. And the game is therefore a perpetual nightmare where the spirits of your victims torment your conscience until your execution. He even connects it to a real life tragedy at a Chuck E. Cheese in Colorado. In retrospect, I think it was a bit of a stretch, but he made an effort to be as respectful as possible possible about that detail, and I confess, I really did think it was a solid video. Watching this video is kind of surreal today, because it all seemed so simple back then, but of course Matty Boy would go on to make 97 more videos on Five Nights. Apparently the later games have time travel now? He finds himself in a, wait for this, time traveling ball pit. On top of all this, you had Scotty Boy's website that was full of all these hidden messages and he kept updating it every other week. It was almost as though the game had a dual function as some kind of ARG. All of this is to say that Five Nights at Fred was a very interesting game to say the least, and I think it was an important moment in the legitimacy of indie games. This less is more approach where instead of saturating the game with extreme blood and gore and jump scaring you every three seconds unavoidably, instead choosing to slowly create build up and unbearably anxious atmosphere and hiding the more frightening details in the background was such a unique approach to storytelling, made even more effective with remarkably tense gameplay that at its core is honestly very simple simple, but deviously sensitive if you make a mistake. A few months later, BAM! A trailer for Five Nights 2. Scotty Boy made a sequel. It was teased in this freaky teaser trailer where it was teased with its teasiness. This game was kind of like a perfect sequel. You had 10 robots instead of 4. You got more cameras and you had this shitty balloon bitch that I want to kick across a football field. I mean, what more could you ask for? It's amazing. From a gameplay perspective, Five Nights 2 is more intense than Doom Eternal. You have to placate 10 robots at once who all have different patterns and deterrence and there are no doors to close. So there's nothing preventing them from entering your room and killing you. There's this music box you gotta keep winding up, the building itself can't run out of power but your flashlight can so you gotta make sure not to overuse it even though you have to in order to keep Foxy from killing you. It's not quite as atmospheric as the first game but it more than makes up for it with its intensity. Unfortunately there is still some element of random bullshit to it but it does still require a degree of skill to balance the aggression of all 10 robots and their attack patterns. Five Nights 2 added an additional dimension to the game's storytelling with these 8-bit minigames showing some of the events in the game's backstory. I don't have any of my own footage of these minigames because you can only get them sometimes when you die, which never happened to me because I'm just too good. This was not quite as cool in my opinion as the background details in the first game, but it was still pretty interesting because it raised a bunch more questions and expanded on the lore four times over. Apparently there are now four restaurants and there's this purple guy who seems to be the murderer and he may or may not also be the phone guy, uh, there's new possible motives, the new robots are actually 
actually cyberpunk security bots connected to predator databases, which considering it's a Chuck E. Cheese, seems like it would be way out of their 1987 budget, but uh, apparently the bite of 87 might have been happening in between days where one of the day shift guys who may or may not also be the killer gets uh, bitten by one of the robots or something. When we get it all sorted out, we may move into the day shift. This one just became available. One of the coolest things about Five Nights 2 was that when it first came out, there were a lot of people debating over whether it was a sequel or a prequel. The game hadn't even been out for a day, and it was already the subject of crazy conspiracy theories. Although, considering Foam Boy dies in the first game, surprise, surprise, yeah, I didn't put a spoiler warning, but this is a seven-year-old game, alright? Get good. I think saying it's a sequel is a pretty safe assertion. You know, part of me feels like Five Nights 2 was the perfect place to end things. Much like the background details in the first game, this one attempts to answer some questions while also introducing new questions and new variables. And if Scotty Boy left it here, I think I would have been perfectly fine with that. A few months later, Five Nights at Freddy's 3. This is where things get a tiny bit confusing. Instead of a pizzeria, you are now playing the part of a security guard at a Freddy Fazbear's pizza-themed haunted attraction, basically a FNAF escape room, if you will. It takes place a long time after the first two games. At this point, I think the most impressive thing about these games was the frequency at which they were coming out. I don't think Scott could have predicted the success of the first game, but once Markiplier and the boys got that fire started, Started, Scott jumped on it pretty quickly. Some people say he was just milking a cash cow at this point, and to be honest, maybe he was, but do I blame him? Hell no. Like, especially if you're an indie developer who knows how it is to fall on hard times, why wouldn't you make it a big series? And in my opinion at least, they were still largely not bad games at this point, in spite of their minimalist approach. That being said, from a gameplay perspective, Five Nights 3 was a little underwhelming. For one thing, there's only one animatronic this time, the Spring Trap, and all the other ones are just hallucinations because you've been huffing too much gas. Unlike the other games where jump scares were a largely avoidable thing by simply getting good at the game, this is not the case in Five Nights 3 where you get jump scared by hallucinations every three seconds. This game is probably the most frustrating one in my experience. When you saturate anything with jump scares, they quickly lose their appeal as frightening elements of the game, and instead just become fucking annoying. The goal of the game is to lure Springtrap away from your room by playing balloon bitch noises over the intercom until 6am and sealing off the vents. It's not bad per se, but definitely less intense than the second game. To make it more intense though, the three main mechanics, the ventilation, intercom, and camera system keep fucking up every 10 seconds and you have to keep resetting those systems with this shitty Linux box that the player probably coded himself. Five Nights 3 is a lot more atmospheric than the second game. There's a lot more ambient noise, the air feels thicker and more dense, but unfortunately, instead of building up the haunting feeling with amazing suspense and subtle details, Five Nights 3 takes a much more heavy-handed approach as a horror game. It's a very eerie and atmospheric setting that's trampled by the annoying-ass jump scares. On the other hand, the lore in this game is hidden in such ridiculously obtuse puzzles, such as typing a phone number into square tiles on the wall of the office. What the fuck is this Silent Hill PT bullshit? How in the name of dick was I ever gonna figure that out? At this point, I think it was pretty clear that the series was now selling itself on its lore more than anything else, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But another thing that really screwed me around was Divergent Timelines. This game actually has a good ending and a bad Bad ending, and the only way to get the good ending is to do all these ass backwards puzzles that very few people would probably figure out on their own. Even though there are hints and clues hidden in these mini games, I find it unlikely that the majority of this game's target demographic was able to do this all without consulting the interwebs. Even though I think Freddy's 2 was a good place to end things, this was like the second best place. While there were additional pieces of lore, the good ending of the game seemed largely conclusive and like a good note to end end on. As a matter of fact, I seem to recall Scott saying that this would be the last game at the time, but whether he actually said that or not, it didn't matter because guess what?
Five Nights at Freddy's 4. This is about the time I decided that I was kinda done with Five Nights at Freddy's. Not only did I not really click with the gameplay of this one, but the additions to the lore were starting to feel less like they were all cohesively tied together and more like Scott was simply introducing new characters and story arcs to continuously pump life into the series. It started to feel less like a case of everything being planned and thought out from the beginning and more like something that was just spiraling out of control and naturally, as usual, I was correct. This shit just spun off the fucking rails. I was aware that there was a fifth game called Sister Location and the FNAF World spin-off The Ultimate Custom Night, but what I wasn't privy to was the Pizzeria Simulator, uh, Help Wanted, or Special Delivery. I knew there were books, but holy shit, that's a lot of books. There's a goddamn side-scrolling beat-em-up now? Like, what the fuck? What is Five Nights at Freddy's anymore? I don't even know. It's, like, unrecognizable to me at this point. The only thing that I'm aware is on the horizon is that security breach game which I saw on that PlayStation Direct. I'm looking at it and it doesn't look terrible, but I feel like I'm gonna be completely lost, like I'm gonna need to consume 18 pieces of supplementary media in order to fully understand the events of the game, including the full history of the dude who composed Toreador March. In any case, maybe I just grew out of it, but I don't think that's the whole reason. Even today, playing those first two games and even the third to an extent was still an experience that I don't feel bad about or like I wasted my time. While playing those first two games, I was genuinely on the edge of my seat the entire time, and the additional context provided by the phone guy's messages made it a very haunting and effective experience. Even though the lore has already been pieced together in 68 game theory videos, those first games themselves are honestly not so bad in my opinion. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about one of my favorite things that came out of Five Nights at Freddy's, which was all the fan games that it inspired. We got One Night at the Krusty Krab where you get killed by Spongebob, robots, you have the One Night at Flumpty's game where Flumpty Bumpty, the talking egg who can transcend time and space, tries to rip your dick out. And then you have my favorite fan games of all time. Five Nights at Fuckboys, the games where Freddy and his text-to-speech friends go on an extensive quest to destroy all the cameras. I don't care what anyone says, this is the funniest shit I have seen, even though it's been seven years. Hi! Inhale my dong enragement child. In any case, it seems like Five Nights at Freddy's as a series has gone down a path that I don't really have the patience to follow anymore, but it was fun while it lasted. And who knows, maybe that security breach game will turn out pretty alright, but I guess we'll have to see. Happy Halloween, fuckos.